Good luck, everyone. I've got it. Got it. Good morning, everybody. Just waiting to let everybody in. Oh, are we are we full, Matthias? I think it would be good to wait uh, wait one minute uh, at least. Yeah. I think everyone has arrived, so. Fantastic, thank you. Good morning, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see all, a whole load of people who have been with us from the beginning and also new faces and new names. Um, I welcome you to the LSE Anthropology Department and the fifth in our series of seminars to pay tribute to our friend and colleague, David Graeber. I'm Alpa Shah, I'm a professor in the anthropology department here and I'm chairing this series. Today we will discuss uh, a pamphlet that David published way back in 2004 with Prickly Paradigm Press called Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology. Uh, this short booklet is, to my mind at least, uh, foundational for charting the path that David, David would develop in later work. Uh, some of the key theoretical ideas actually flower in the just published Dawn of Everything 17 years later. Um, and, you know, were seeded. I mean, they were seeded in fragments and then watered over the years in David's other writings. In fragments, David asks the question what sort of social theory would? actually be of interest to those who are trying to help bring about a world in which people are free to govern their own affairs. It is here that he makes the case for anthropology being particularly well placed to offer possibilities, alternatives to the world we live in. And it is here that he makes the case for anthropologists to make common cause with anarchists to use the tools we have for human freedom. Uh, it's a kind of manifesto. In fact, uh, he does call section of it, sections of it tiny manifestos for anthropology. We're fortunate today to have two brilliant anthropologists to discuss fragments with us. So let me introduce them to you. The first is Keir Martin, a professor of social anthropology at the University of Oslo. Keir is currently leading a research project on the spread of psychotherapy among the growing middle classes of Asia and is himself a qualified psychotherapist. His earlier work focused on contests over the limits of reciprocal obligation and their role in shaping the boundaries of business and other social entities. He conducted his main field work in East New Britain province, Papua New Guinea, on which he wrote a book called The Death of the Big Man and The Rise of the Big Shots, Custom and Conflict in New East Britain, in East New Britain. Now, as the title suggests, this work focuses on the emergence of new forms of social stratification in Papua New Guinea, which is fascinating, of course, to us as Papua New Guinea is a place that is famous for giving rise to anthropological theories of reciprocity and mutual obligation, which are at the center of um, fragments. Keir charts how this social stratification, how, how with this social stratification comes the rise of 
contested assertions of individual autonomy. And he explores how people seek freedom from customary obligation as a key constituent of that emerging stratification. So yeah, you can see why his work makes him particularly well-placed, particularly well-placed to provide a critical engagement with David's thoughts. We also have with us Aicha Chubakchu, who is our colleague here in the sociology department, uh, where she is associate professor in human rights and co-directs LSE Human Rights. Aicha's doctoral foundations are in anthropology and her book for The Love of Humanity, The World Tribunal on Iraq, is based on two years of ethnographic fieldwork with the global anti-war movement that emerged in response to the occupation of Iraq in 2003. And that sought to provide grounds for adjudicating war crimes committed by the US, the UK and their allied forces during the Iraq war. Aicha based her fieldwork amongst a decentralized network of anti-war activists in 20 cities around the world. And her book is an illumination of the tribunal as a sympathetic participant and a reflection on the challenges of forging global solidarity against imperialism. So you can see why Aicha is wonderfully placed to be commenting on, on David's work, uh, especially this text. Um, both of our speakers have, of course, done much, much more and wear many hats and have both have written for wider publics. But importantly, both were good friends of David. Aicha met David as part of New York City's Direct Action Network in the early 2000s, and they taught together a seminar at the Breck Forum in New York on John Holloway's book, Change the World Without Taking Power, The Meaning of Revolution Today. This intellectual and political friendship continued when they became colleagues, uh, or we all became colleagues at the LSC. David and Kerr um, met at a conference on debt, a subject on which Kerr has also done some excellent work but they were really drawn together by their joint interest in calling to account what was going on at the journal How, a journal that David had prominently supported in its early days. As the How affair receded, other shared interests took over. They were intellectually engaged in the work of the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott and a relational theory of the mind, which they hoped to write about together. Thank you, Keir. Thank you, Aisha, for joining us. I'll first give the floor to Keir for 20 minutes, then to Aisha, and then we will open up for comments and questions from the floor. Thank you. Keir, over to you. Keir, you need to unmute yourself, please. We can't hear you. Of course, the unmute button was now hidden under the bottom of the taskbar. Despite having been doing this for two years, I'm still messing it up on a serial basis. So apologies to everyone. So now uh, let me segue back into thank you so much, Alpha, for that very, very kind introduction. And um, without further ado, let me begin with the task I've been set. So Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology is a book that fizzes with a multiplicity of ideas. So many, in fact, that they seem on occasion to overgrow the boundaries of the text. And in the book, we see many themes that were to be developed in more detail in later years, in books such as Debt, The First 5,000 Years, Bullshit Jobs, and his posthumous magnum opus, co-author with David Wengrow, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity. All of the different overflowing themes share a common underlying thread, however, namely a desire to learn from and explore the multiplicity of alternatives to hierarchy and competition that are already in existence, often right underneath our noses, rather than lay down a fixed template for resistance. Rather than trying to resolve the Leninist question of what is to be done, David continuously asks his readers to reflect upon the implications of what is already being done. And it is in this regard that David's anarchism and his anthropology most clearly complement each other by slowing down and paying attention to the variety of ways in which people step outside of and subvert hierarchy in order to make a life more worth living. Anthropology might, David argues, become the liberatory discipline par excellence if only its practitioners were able to realize the potential power within their practice. 
So let me take just one example from Fragments. On page 60, David discusses the Italian autonomous theory of revolutionary exodus, a theory itself inspired by a previous refusal of large numbers of young Italians to engage in wage labor. David writes that, in all of this, Italy seems to have acted as a kind of laboratory for future social movements, anticipating trends that are now beginning to happen on a global scale. Now, if this was true when David wrote Fragments back in 2004, how much more so is it the case today, when the so-called Great Resignation poses the greatest threat to the return of business as usual in the aftermath of the COVID-19 lockdowns? A quick scan of headlines on national public radio in the US, for example, tells the story. Business should be booming if only there are enough workers for the job. Or, as the pandemic recedes, millions of workers are saying, I quit. And why are they quitting? I think the pandemic has changed my mindset in a way, like I really value my time, says Jonathan Caballero, a 27-year-old software engineer, who previously commuted 45 minutes each way to work on a daily basis. Now I believe that work has to accommodate life. Elisa Casey, a researcher for the federal government states that, I think the pandemic just allowed for time. You just have more time to think about what you really want. An NPR reports of 42 year old restaurant manager, Jeremy Golombieski and his decision to join the great resignation. In the months that followed COVID, Golombieski's life changed. He was spending time doing fun things, like setting up a playroom in his garage for his two young children and cooking dinner for the family. At age 42, he got a glimpse of what life could be like if he didn't have to put in 50 to 60 hours a week at the restaurant and miss Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas morning with his family. I want to see my one-year-old and my five-year-old's faces light up when they come out and see the tree and all the presents that I spent six hours at night assembling and putting out, says Golombieski who got his first restaurant job at 16 as a dishwasher at the big boy chain in Michigan. So Golombieski apparently comes from humble origins, but even high-end executives are not immune from the humanizing influence of lockdown. Will Station, a vice president at Boeing, is reported by NPR as, quote, becoming emotional, realizing how much of his children's lives he previously missed and how much he's getting to experience now. I got to see my kids and see their world in a way that I've never experienced before, he says. It's very special. Even with all the chaos, this has been a bonus year for me. Now, NPR also reports in June that people quitting jobs in normal times would signal a healthy economy, but these are not normal times. The pandemic, in fact, led to the worst recession in US history, and still a record four million quit their jobs in April. And the situation, has continued in the months since. The great resignation appears to be getting worse, complained Kylie Logan and Lance Lambert on the Fortune 500 news website. Two authors who for some reason seem unhappy that thousands of men such as Station and Golombieski are discovering the joy of spending irreplaceable time with their growing children. And so in September, a new record of 4.4 million resignations were recorded. Now, the Great Resignation is one of those phenomena that shows most clearly, I'd argue, the interconnection of aspects of life that are often kept conceptually separate. We see, for example, in the examples above, not simply an individualistic take this job and shove it kind of mood, but also the ways in which the refusal of work seems to open the possibility for a reimagining re gendered relations of kinship and care. Relations that anthropologists have long argued are intimately and unavoidably entwined with the world of paid employment. Now, there's quite a bit of talk in last week's seminar of the way in which David was sceptical of the kind of great transformation picture of the emergence of capitalist modernity that is an otherwise conventional framing for many of us in political economic anthropology. And indeed, in fragments, David is quite explicit about this scepticism, stating that, and I quote, almost everyone agrees that somewhere in the 16th or 17th or 18th centuries, a great transformation occurred, that it occurred in Western Europe and its settler colonies, and that because of it, we became modern. And that once we did, we became a fundamentally different sort of creature than anything that had come before. But what if we kicked this whole apparatus away? It's worth making the point, however, that David's argument was not, as he also put it, quote, that nothing important has happened over the past 500 years, any more than I'm arguing that cultural differences are unimportant. 
His argument rather was that once we drop the assumption that this always has to be the starting framing of analysis, and once we decide to, and again I quote, at least entertain the notion that we aren't quite so special as we'd like to think, we can also begin to think about what really has changed and what hasn't. So for David, alternatives to what we think we are can potentially be found in our present daily practice. They don't necessarily have to be sought before the total transformation of the rise of capitalism or after the great transformation of the total revolution that is yet to come. David was concerned with the way in which the fetishization of something called the market or the economy as separate from the rest of society prioritize particular relational obligations over others. Not least the way in which it made, meant that life had to accommodate work and not the other way round, as criticised by Caballero. And this is, of course, in many regards, an eminently Polanyian critique of the performative effects of the rhetorical disembodying of, disembedding of the market economy from society and the consequent setting up of that market economy as society's driving institution. And David was also always keen to point out that in our daily practice that market rationality relies upon, always in Polanyi's terms, still embedded within other moral perspectives and practices. Both David and Polanyi knew that any transformation that might have occurred in recent centuries, great or otherwise, could never ultimately create an economy with the people left out. And that any attempt to do so was doomed to be nothing but a shallow liberal utopia. And so, although the great resignation came as a surprise to many, one suspects it would not have come as a surprise to David nor to Polanyi, who might well have seen it as an example of the famous double movement by which society, in this case in the shape of Gorombieski Station and millions more like them, protect themselves from a disembedded market morality and begin to prioritise the reproduction of persons over the production of objects and economic value. For David, it would have been further proof, if more were needed, that something radically different to what we think we have to be now has been within us and in front of us all along. We might well find radical difference before the Great Transformation, after the Revolution, or indeed at the end of a tributary of the Amazon River, but we don't necessarily have to go looking there. We're as likely to find such differences in an Amazon distribution centre, as long as we know how to look. And David was, of course, fascinated by the grand historical narratives and the reassuringly exotic ethnographic examples upon which this discipline is built. He wouldn't have spent so long conducting fieldwork on magic in Madagascar or researching the role of wampum in early American colonial contacts if he wasn't interested in such things. But he also pointed out that assuming that these were the only potential points from which radical difference could be observed meant that we were likely to overlook them in other spaces. David did feel that the most common use of anthropology by radicals and anarchists, the vision of the egalitarian hunter-gatherer paradise was of limited value. I don't think we're losing much if we admit that human beings never really lived in the Garden of Eden, he argues in fragments, again presaging the more fully worked out and demonstrated argument underpinning the dawn of everything. Examples from different times and places are not necessarily to be used, David argues, as examples or templates of things called anarchist societies to be contrasted as what David describes as imaginary totalities to our own. And indeed, Whatever new forms of society, sociality that you and I and Station and Gombieski and all the rest of us may build in the future, it's unlikely to look much like the Kung Sang or the Binding. And such romantic appropriations are indeed vulnerable to a number of conservative objections. So in order to give up hierarchy, we have to give up antibiotics and central heating and clean water too. The alternative that you have to offer Station and Gombieski is that they establish an imaginary totality called an anarchist society that goes endlessly wandering across the Orange County in search of nuts and berries. If this is the only or the main use that radicals or anarchists can make of the anthropological record, then doesn't it implicitly accept or at the very least strengthen the teleology that the dawn of everything sets out to weaken? Namely, that even if our past might have been a Rousseauian paradise rather than a Hobbesian nightmare, that social complexity and technology by their very definition require ever more complex and technologically developed forms of monitoring, control, discipline, hierarchy and oppression. Instead, if, as David suggests in fragments, we knock down the walls in our thought that separate complex from simple societies, or indeed separate the West from the rest, 
that maybe this can, as he puts it, allow us to see this history as a resource in much more interesting ways. So when David introduces the example of the Italian autonomist engaged withdrawal I mentioned earlier, he does it immediately after a discussion of Cassia Ekholm's analysis of the Congo monarchy as an empty shell that people simply withdrew from. What relevance might this historical practice have for today, David asks? Taking the walls of separation between an opposition between Italian modernity and Congolese non-modernity for granted means that we almost inevitably start our analysis for looking for the radical difference that we assume must be hidden within. But knocking down the conceptual walls enables us to see it from a different perspective and to see something that often gets missed, a shared desire for greater freedom and attention to the reproduction of valued human, human relations that both of these withdrawals embody. And throughout fragments, David uses such examples, but repeatedly in a manner designed to stress the ways in which they might, to some extent at least, express such common shared human desires. Differences exist, of course, differences of culture, differences of perspective, differences of power, differences of privilege. For an anarchist like David, that almost went without saying. But they are differences that come in and out of being in shifting contexts not the expression of a historical, essentialized cultural difference that can only ever be understood by a small coterie of scholars who would be able to see over the wall that separates West from West. And they are often the most important differences are those that emerge within and from within oneself, such as the shift in perspective when men such as those mentioned above begin to see their children and their own lives in a different light and attempt to withdraw from the obligations that seek to nullify that new perspective. And if we can't see how radical and potentially important that is, is that simply because so many of us have naturalized and now fail to even notice the essentially bizarre character of capitalist cosmology? It is a cosmology that in some forms, after all, insists that we must believe in the existence of a mysterious cosmic invisible hand that would distribute goods to us in a fair and efficient manner, at least if we worship it properly, by amongst other things, sacrificing our children to it in the form of giving up so much mutually valuable and precious life enriching time with them in order to appease its jealous demands in the form of the labor market. This is, on reflection, a cosmology as wild and exotic and as fascinating as anything to be found in the ethnographic record. And David would point out that the rejection of it that we see today is therefore potentially a profound and revolutionary one, but one that is far less likely to be taken seriously in some corners of our discipline that is still wedded to what Arjun Apajurai famously referred to as sightings of the savage as its default mode of intellectual or political critique. I should note in passing that David would probably not have been too pleased with me for wheeling out Apajura in defense of his position. It would be fair to say that David was not exactly a fan. A few weeks ago, and I hope Chris doesn't mind me sharing this story, a few weeks ago Chris Gregory mentioned having initially thought that David was something of a bullshit artist. And I can indeed confirm the truth of this account. The first time I met David was at a conference in Cambridge about 10 years ago. Chris and David and I were billeted together at a college some distance from the other participants. And so we spent quite a bit of time together. Chris would really complain to me after breakfast that it was bad enough having to listen to David all day at the conference, but having to endure it first thing in the morning before he'd even woken up properly was quite another thing altogether. And then when Chris was out of the room, David started talking to me very excitedly about how thrilled he was to be hanging out with the author of his very favourite book, Gifts and Commodities, and how dishonest and uncorrect he felt that Apajurai's critique of it in the social life of things had been. As the most junior person in the room, it was a slightly difficult and awkward situation to manage. Although I wasn't surprised to hear that Chris had come round to being a huge fan of David's a few years later. David was on occasion a difficult man to converse with, particularly before you'd have breakfast but I knew that the quality and ambition of David's work would prove irresistible to Chris in the long run. And in the following years, David would occasionally ask us rhetorically, why do they always refer to me with a sneer as the anarchist anthropologist? Why not always refer to Abelardian Apajurite as the neoliberal anthropologist? It's just as accurate, but it doesn't get constantly attached to his name as a pejorative in the same way. Now, of course, David knew he was being slightly disingenuous here, Apajurai, after all, hadn't authored a book entitled Fragments of a Neoliberal Anthropology. So whether or not David was correct to label him as such, 
it's not surprising that such a label was slightly less easily attached to him than it was to David. But the underlying point that David was making, that David's scholarship was endlessly and subtly sneered at and undermined by repeatedly introducing him as such, even when it wasn't necessarily relevant, was a valid and important point to make. And it was typical of David, that rather than shy away from the association with anarchist theory, an association that he knew would be used to belittle him and his work, that he instead chose to take that prejudice on head first, early in his career, before he had the security of tenure. The book that came out of this, Fragments, is a book that I found a little frustrating on first read. I found the way in which it jumped from point to point and back again a little, well, fragmentary. And much as I'm sure that David was aware that there was a certain paradox in the author of a book entitled Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology, subsequently complaining that people refer to him as the anarchist anthropologist, I was aware that I was to an extent missing the point by feeling frustrated at the fragmentary nature of a book with the same title. I felt myself to be in a similar position to the kind of American tourist one occasionally overhears in Copenhagen, loudly complaining that the statue of the Little Mermaid is too small. But on second reading, however, I got on with the book a lot better. As with a conversation with David in real life, one simply had to allow oneself to go with the flow. And if one did, it was a conversation and experience like no other. Like Chris, I felt David to be perhaps a little much on first meeting particularly before I'd had a chance to have my first cup of coffee. But in later years, as I got to know David better, I looked forward to those wonderful rambling conversations that went from Ray Davis through Lukash onto Rodney Dangerfield, and then back home via a detour to discuss 18th century Madagascan pirates. And I think David's intellectual range sometimes irritated those who envied it and wanted to pull him back into the narrow, arid scripture scholarship of the intellectual silos that they had settled for. The kinds of people who write things in anonymous peer review, such as, I can't believe that the author of this paper on value seems totally unaware of Malinowski's seminal footnote on Troby and Yam exchange from 1937. And I suspect that what upset those kinds of people most about David was that they knew he probably was aware of those precious little nuggets of knowledge that they curated. It was just that, as he always did, he chose to go his own way and make his own connections instead. And in many regards, I would argue that is David's greatest gift to the academy. We all know that this is a profession in which success is often driven by networks, by nepotism and by ass kissing, more than it is driven by the alleged liberal values of free thought and intellectual inquiry. And in such a context, David stood out by his consistent refusal to ever do anything but his own thing. And I'm sure it made him a frustrating colleague at times. But as we all know, the category of good colleague is a double-edged sword. Sometimes it means the person who turns their marking in on time. And I would not be surprised to hear from former colleagues that sometimes David's contempt for what he might view as the bullshit parts of his job on occasion might have left other people picking up the pieces. But let us also remember that all too often being a good colleague means being the person who turns a blind eye to the bad behaviour and abuse on the part of senior or powerful colleagues out of a desire to protect the institution. And after years in this profession, my skin tends to crawl when I hear senior colleagues praise the virtues of collegiality. My first instinct is to wonder whose body are we burying or whose mouth are we taping up today? And I remain immensely grateful to David for consistently prioritizing being a good person over being a good colleague in that respect. And on occasion, I miss him very much. But with fragments, we have something that keeps something of that spirit of David alive. It's irreverent, it's bursting with ideas, and most of all, it's principle. Whether we all agree with all those principles or not, there's a wonderful spirit of freedom in this short book, a spirit of freedom that senior academics often tell us that we need to squeeze out of ourselves as the price of admission to the ivory towers. And the greatest gift I think that David gave us with fragments of an anarchist anthropology is the enduring proof that we don't have to listen to them. Thank you, Keir. That was marvelous. Um, so needed, big context, uh, as political as fragments, uh, what we need right now. Um, Aicha, over to you. Thank you. First of all, uh, very many thanks to Alpa and the Department of Anthropology at LSE for organizing this series, this tribute to our dear friend and colleague, 
David Graeber. Uh, I'm going to read as well. I'm going to be referring to David as Graeber because it's uh, still very difficult for me to speak about him. Uh, so I'll try to distance myself a little bit, hopefully not too much. Published in 2004 in the inspirational context of a veritably exploding anarchism around the world, David Graeber's Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology is a tiny and mighty genre-defying text. Graeber calls it a pamphlet, a series of thoughts, sketches of potential theories, and tiny manifestos. The pamphlet is impossible to summarize and discuss fully in 20 minutes, especially since in hindsight, it bears the seeds of many of the major arguments Graeber was to develop later in life. I will therefore limit myself to sketching only the basics of the kind of social theory that Graeber is proposing in the spirited text. Broadly, Fragments seeks to outline a body of radical theory that would, in his words, actually be of interest to those who are trying to help bring about a world in which people are free to govern their own affairs. This is characteristic of Graeber, the desire to render social theory, particularly anthropology, usefully interesting to radical movements and radical movements, particularly anarchism, useful and interesting to social theory. In the fragments, Graeber explores what he names the strange affinity between anarchism and anthropology. He observes there was something about anthropological thought in particular, its keen awareness of the very range of human possibilities that gave it an affinity to anarchism from the beginning. Graeber himself was fascinated by this, the range of hu human possibilities in the past and the present, which could unravel the seeming inevitability of our current social and political institutions, while grounding hope for living collectively with greater freedom in more egalitarian arrangements. But Graeber is able to observe the strange affinity between anthropology and anarchism in the fragments because in his version, anarchism is not about a body of theory bequeathed in the 19th century by founding figures such as Bakunin, Kropotkin and Prodom that one would have to adopt wholesale. Instead, it is more about a particular attitude, even a faith, he says, that is shared among anarchists. Anarchism can be thought of as a faith, Graeber asserts, which involves, I quote, the rejection of certain types of social relations, the confidence that certain others would be much better ones on which to build a livable society, and the belief that such a society could actually exist. Likewise, the founding figures of anarchism did not think they invented anything new. They simply made a faithful assumption that, in Graeber's words, the basic principles of anarchism, self-organization, voluntary association, mutual aid, referred to forms of human behavior they assumed to have been around as long as humanity. The same goes for the rejection of the state and all forms of structural violence, inequality, or domination, uncle. Arguably, it is this assumption about human history that Graeber sets out to prove valid in his latest book, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity, which he co-authored with the archaeologist David Wengro, who is here with us today. Humanity has always practiced anarchistic forms of human behavior and social organization since the Ice Age. In Graeber's vision, in any case, anthropology as a discipline could strengthen faith in the possibility of another world by offering an archive of alternative ways of organizing social relations, of reconstituting them consciously, or of abandoning them altogether. But to be able to strengthen this faith in the possibility of another world, free from the state, capitalism, 
racism and male dominance, social theory itself would have to assume another world is possible. In fact, Graeber asserts this as the first assumption that any radical social theory has to make. To commit oneself to such a principle is almost an act of faith, he finds, since how can one have certain knowledge of such matters? It might possibly turn out, he says, that such a world is not possible, unquote. In a move that resembles a sophisticated theological argument about the existence of God, he then declares, it's this very unavailability of absolute knowledge which makes a commitment to optimism a moral imperative. I wonder, however, if anthropologists or others can be drawn into such faithful optimism by argumentation. Perhaps one could be inspired to have faith in the possibility of another world, but inspired David Graeber did, along with the radical movements he dearly treasured. Graeber's second proposition is that any radical, particularly anarchist social theory, would have to self-consciously reject any trace of vanguardism. To his mind, ethnography as an anthropological method provides a particularly relevant, if a rough and incipient model of how non-vanguardist revolutionary intellectual practice may work. The goal of such a practice would not be to arrive at the correct strategic analysis and then lead the masses to follow, but to tease out the implicit logics, symbolic, moral, pragmatic, that already underline people's actions, even if they are themselves not completely aware of them. One obvious role for a radical intellectual is to do precisely that, Graeber writes in the fragments, to look at those who are creating viable alternatives, try to figure out what might be the larger implications of what they are already doing, and then offer those ideas back, not as prescriptions, but as contributions, possibilities, gifts. Not prescriptions, but contributions, possibilities, gifts. That is what Graeber did in his work, particularly in the fragments of an anarchist anthropology, direct action and ethnography, and the democracy project, whether his gifts were accepted or not by everyone he wrote about, thought and acted with, or for that matter was read by. After all, gifts too can be rejected. And as Graeber recognized, not much of what he proposed or practiced as an anthropologist had much to do with what anthropology, even radical anthropology has actually been like over the last hundred years or so, he says. Nevertheless, in the fragments, Graeber turns to anthropologists, most notably Marcel Mauss, to reflect on his influence on anarchists, despite the fact that Mauss had nothing good to say about anarchists themselves. In the end, though, Graeber writes, as if speaking about himself, Marcel Mauss has probably had more influence on anarchists than all the other anthropologists combined. This is because, he says, he was interested in alternative moralities, which opened the way to thinking that societies without states and markets were the, were the way they were because they actively wished to live that way, which in our terms means because they were anarchists. In so far as fragments of an anarchist anthropology do already exist, they largely drive uh, uh, from him, unquote. In my interpretation, Graeber's own interest in developing an anarchist anthropology uh, too was driven by an appreciation of and fascination by alternative moralities that underpin people's self-conscious determination to live otherwise. In the anarchist case, free from capitalism and patriarchy, free from the state, structural violence, inequality and domination. This is what I mean by alternative ethics, Graeber explains in a critical section of the fragments where he theorizes revolutionary counterpower and foreshadows a core argument he co-authors in The Dawn of Everything. <clears throat> 
he says, anarchistic societies are no more unaware of human capacities for greed and vainglory than modern Americans are unaware of human capacities for envy, gluttony, or sloth. They would just find them equally unappealing as the basis for their civilization. In fact, they see this phenomena as moral dangers so dire, they end up organizing much of their social life around containing them, unquote. I think this is a remarkable proposition. First, it is determined to cast ethics and morality as the constitutive self-conscious grounds of social organization. Second, it intimates this to be the case across human history, modern or pre-modern. In fact, Graeber argues that any really politically engaged anthropology will have to start by seriously confronting the question of what, if anything, really divides what we like to call the modern world from the rest of human history, unquote. In the fragments, as well as in the dawn of everything, he passionately rejects familiar historical periodizations and evolutionary stages such that the entirety of human history, <coughs> history, along with every society, people and civilization across time and space, becomes populated by examples of human possibility enacted by decidedly imaginative, intelligent, playful, experimental, thoughtful, creative, and politically self-conscious creatures. For Graeber, human history does not consist of a series of revolutions, be it the Neolithic Revolution, the Agricultural Revolution, the French Revolution, or the Industrial Revolution, that introduce clear social, moral, or political breaks in the nature of social reality or the human condition, as he prefers to think of it. If this is the case, if this is the case, and if anarchism is above all an ethics of practice, as Graeber insists, such an ethics becomes available for anthropological study and political inspiration alike across human history. It is important to note, however, that Graeber passionately disagrees with primitivist anarchists inspired by his anthropologist mentor Marshall Sheldon's influential essay, The Original Affluent Society, anarchists who proposed that there was a time when alienation and inequality did not exist, when everyone was a hunter-gathering anarchist, and that therefore real liberation can only come if we abandon civilization, unquote. In the fragments and the dawn of everything, he instead draws a more complex history of endless variety, where, for instance, there were hunter-gatherer societies with nobles and slaves and agrarian societies that are fiercely egalitarian. Graeber insists, in other words, that humans never lived in the Garden of Eden. This is from the fragments, 2004. The significance of this finding is manifold. Among other things, it means that history can become a resource for us, he says, in much more interesting ways, and that radical theorists no longer have to pour endlessly over the same scant 200 years of revolutionary history. Writing of revolution in the fragments, Graeber rejects its commonplace definition, which, quote, has always implied something in the nature of a paradigm shift, a clear break, a fundamental rupture in the nature of social reality, after which everything works differently and previous categories no longer apply. Instead, he urges us to stop, I'm quoting, to stop thinking about revolution as a thing, the revolution, the great cataclysmic break, and instead ask, what is revolutionary action? He stresses that I quote, revolutionary action is any collective action which rejects and therefore confronts some form of power or domination and in doing so reconstitutes social relations even within the collectivity in that light. 
without necessarily aiming the aiming to topple a government or for that matter, the head of an anthropology department. Now I mentioned this possibility in the playful spirit of David to bring us back to the here and now and to the final section of the fragments titled Anthropology in which David somehow reluctantly bites the hand that feeds him. He says, that's his own title. Graeber observes how, instead of adopting any kind of radical politics, anthropologists have risked becoming, he says, yet another clog in a global identity machine, a planet-wide apparat apparatus of institutions and assumptions whereby all debates about the nature of political or economic possibilities are seen to be over. And the only way, he says, one can now make a political claim is by asserting some group identity with all the assumptions about what identity is. And bitingly, he declares, the perspective of the anthropologist and the global marketing executive have become almost indistinguishable. But what does Graeber propose for anthropology instead? Observing that anthropologists are effectively sitting on a vast archive of human experience of social and political experiments no one really knows about, he regrets that this archive of human experience is treated by anthropologists as our dirty little secret. Of course, it was colonial violence that made such an archive possible in the first place, as Graeber recognizes without reluctance, he says. The discipline we know today was made possible by horrific schemes of conquest, colonization, and mass murder, much like most modern academic disciplines. Nevertheless, he makes the remarkable, remarkably da daring proposition to my mind that I quote, the fruits of ethnography and the techniques of eth ethnography could be enormously helpful for radical movements around the world. If anthropologists, if anthropologists, he says, could get past their however understandable hesitancy owing to their own often squalid colonial history and come to see what they're sitting on, not as some guilty secret, but as the common property of humankind, unquote. Towards the conclusion, I would like to submit that anarchism and the anthropological knowledge of anarchist ethics, practices, and imaginaries across human history are part of the common property of humankind, which now includes Graeber's own contributions to anarchist theory and practice, along with his astounding imagination of their possible pasts and futures. Allow me to end then with a strikingly imaginative passage from the fragments, which we could receive as an invitation to think and act towards an anarchist future. I quote, anarchist forms of organization would not look anything like a state. They would involve an endless variety of communities, associations, networks, projects on every conceivable scale, overlapping and intersecting in any way we could imagine and possibly many that we can't. Some would be quite local, others global. Perhaps all they would have in common is that none would involve anyone showing up with weapons and telling everyone else to shut up and do what they were told. Since anarchists are not actually trying to seize power within any national territory, the process of one system replacing the other will not take the form of some sudden revolutionary cataclysm, the storming of a Bastille, the seizing of a winter palace, but will necessarily be gradual. The creation of alternative forms of organization on a world scale, new forms of communication, new, less alienated ways of organizing life, which will eventually make currently existing forms of power seem stupid and beside the point. <laughs>
That in turn would mean that there are endless examples of viable anarchisms. Pretty much any form of organization would count as one so long as it was not imposed by some higher authority, unquote. In the fragments of an anarchist anthropology, writing on Madagascar, Graeber observes how, I quote, it often seems that no one really takes on their full authority until they are dead. To my mind, we now have to deal with David's full authority in an anarchist spirit. The task at hand cannot be petrification through idolization or canonization, but the extension of an invitation to think, play, and experiment with its contributions to anthropology and anarchism alike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Aisha. Really wonderful. Um, I, uh, so we put up, um, if, you, if you want to raise your hand uh, to ask a question, that would be wonderful if you can use the raise hand function and I will invite you to the floor. Uh, you can also type in the chats, um, but the raise hand function is better. Um, has any, have I got any raised hands? If not, I may start with a question. Oh, Fanella's got a question. Fanella, would you would you like to? Um, hello, Alpa. Yes, thank you, and um, thanks so much. I really enjoyed listening to both the speakers. Um, I was just reflecting on the sort of um, lived realities as some of the themes on which each of them touched, and um, I don't know what what either what either speaker would say, um, especially perhaps Kia to the suggestion that um, there are maybe two different ways of talking about and experiencing collegiality, one of which would be a genuine inhabitation of an organizational form that sought to exceed hierarchical expectations in institutions. And the other one would be that rhetoric which had been parasitized by hierarchical and management forms within institutions. And therefore, um, you know, I, I felt a slight tension as I was listening to um, the conclusion of Keir's talk um, in this discussion, because it seems to me that it then distinguished between, you know, those, those forms which had been invaded by hierarchical forces, uh, which is, is frequently also a, a mode in which hierarchy chooses to spread. So um, I, just, I just wanted to sort of add a little, <laughs> A little footnote on on that, which is, I suppose, a kind of um, further kind of fractal kind of um, addendum to the idea that one couldn't have an ultimate solution to these to these issues. But it is, it's just a small comment. Thanks for that. Kia Aisha, would you like to address that, please? Yes, I mean, I, I can briefly address that if you like, and I th I thank you. I think that's a very, uh, it's a very interesting and indeed important comment. And I think, I mean, I was trying at the end there to say, look, you know, but rather than being a good colleague, I think what I was more interested in talking about is what is the performative effect on social relations of the concept or the category of the good colleague? as the category of the good colleague is used amongst ourselves in academia. And um, I'm certainly in favor of people, you know, picking up their own socks and doing their own marking and, you know, trying to create non-hierarchical situations where we take care of each other. And I think that's very much what David's idea of a kind of anarchist community would look like. I think what I mean, what I was trying to draw attention to was the way in which there's a tension within how the idea of the good colleague is used in contemporary academia, because I think it embodies both those things that Fenella talked about simultaneously. And sometimes part of the moral confusion is the way in which one use of that term can seem from different perspectives to embody either the, you know, the genuine desire to look after each other in, in, in an academic community and at the same time relationships of hierarchy and power. 
And I think what I was trying to do is basically is to try and dis in the same way that a concept like democracy can, you know, that the concept of democracy is a very noble and wonderful concept, but it can be used to justify massacring and killing people at its worst. So one has to look at the context in which the term is being used. And I was just trying to sort of draw attention to the ways I think in which David was somebody who perhaps wasn't always considered by other people to be a good colleague. I think um, I tried to phrase that as carefully as I can, but I think that was a understanding that some people had. And all I wanted to draw attention to was, as I think Fenella is drawing attention to, that you know, that sometimes being a good colleague means doing some pretty bad things because of the second aspect of collegiality that often gets smuggled in under the mask of the good stuff. Well, it's interesting here because I think we also maybe have to have a kind of intersectional analysis here, um, given that, you know, these definitions have also been very subject to different interpretations by one's gendered positionality or other starting point positionalities that people may have. And, um, you know, perhaps the best colleague is the colleague who's both able to speak the uncomfortable truth to power, um, as David was so brilliant at doing and liberate our imaginations as he was so wonderful at doing, which we so much appreciated and missed, and also pick up one's socks so that the women anarchists are not picking up all the socks in the anarchist, um, anarchist flats when they get home from mm. speaking truth to power. So I just, um, I'm, just I'm offering a, a slightly kind of a frivolous, um, in a way, rejoinder in the spirit of your invitation for mm. playful discussion. Um, <laughs> That's my suggestion to you. Mm. And Thanks. I mean, could I say, I mean, I mean it, it might be put in a frivolous sense, but it's a really, really important point. And my point is certainly not to say that being a good colleague is a bad thing. And it's certainly not to say that one can't do both those things at the same time. Um, I simply, you know, I was one for my own personal reasons that some people will be familiar with. You know, I wanted to draw attention to the occasions when David was a bad colleague in a good way. And I think that it's important we're able to have a discussion that does take into account the things that you talk about as well, that actually we all have to work hard at being a good colleague in the first sense and a bad colleague in the second sense. Sure. Aisha, would you like to add anything? I mean, I could, I think uh, both parties are right here. <laughs> I think here is drawing attention to the ways in which collegiality has been used um, against people like uh, David to as a disciplinary mechanism. But at the same time, I hear Fenella, who is absolutely right, that there are gender ways in which uh, the work that is not done in a department falls on others, etc. So it's I think uh, we should have an intersectional analysis of this, but I hear a collegiality as management speak, you know? Um, it's always, it tends to be used by management of universities to discipline and sometimes fire and deny, deny tenure, uh, as I think David experienced at Yale. Um, but I saw a remark here, Cathy Gardner says, good colleague can certainly be used in oppressive and coercive ways, but also can be about care and support to the collective. And I totally agree. And I think they would, um, would have agreed with that in theory. Thanks. Um, uh, do we have other questions? If not, I may ask a question myself. Oh, we have two people, Sophia Wood Woodman and Lim Zhao. Sophia first. Yeah, um, you're not to know Alpha, but my name is pronounced Sophia, just in case anybody would like Apologies. to know. Apologies. Uh, no problem, Nobody's, nobody can know from this spelling. So I just wanted to thank you all at LSE for organizing this series. And it's, it's such a wonderful opportunity to have these conversations. And I wanted to say, um, and thanks for the two interventions, which, point me to uh, there is something very liberating about what the that book does to say um, you know let's be honest about our uh, our engagement with this world and our 
there's no pose. Give up your pose as a, as a disinterested scholar and, and say uh, where, where you are. And also, the, the, I wanted to raise the manner of the saying as an important part of um, um, what I value about David's work, um, this work and other work, that that is also part of that commitment is to say this I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not to say it's not a complex book and there are lots of complex ideas, but he's always committed to saying it in a way that is for everybody. And, and, and in a way that, that a good colleague discussion is also about opening the academy to people who, 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 who have valid, valid and valuable intellectual contributions who are not part of our... Uh, little cliques and so on. So that was one um, point I wanted to raise. But um, another thing that I um, really value is the focus on um, joy, celebration, and and the importance of that in um, human uh, in uh, as part of the human condition, and um, it, that that. That is a central part of his work and a, and a sort of thread running through this book that I, I think is the crucial element of some of his arguments that one of the reasons people might choose that kind of community is to capture their time to have fun. Thanks, uh, Sophia. Um, I'm going to open the mic for Lim, Lim Zhao, please. Um, we'll hear from you and maybe take one or two more questions from the floor and then I will give back the um, uh, platform to Aisha and Keir to pick up what they'd like. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed this session for both speakers that give a wonderful speech. Uh, so my question is uh, just like that. Uh, in terms of anarchism and emphasis on non stateness of the hierarchies and social costs and social contract that is requires a perfect condition to do it. In, in today's context, do you still associate with the LGBT costs as well? Uh, that is my question. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we have a question uh, from Opal Find X2 about anthropology from its imperial use in colonies. Would you like to unmute yourself and maybe ask your question? Are you with us? Um, I'll read the question anyway. Um, can we claim anthropology from its imperial use in colonies or even knowledge to begin with? Does knowledge and epistemologies need a bit of anarchy too? Um, yeah, uh, maybe it would be great to hear Keir and Aisha's um, perspective on this. And if I'm allowed to throw my own kind of question uh, on this, I'm really kind of um, really interested in, um, you know, the, okay, let's, in, in the spirit of the extend the invitation to talk to David and take him forward. Um, uh, so I read fragments as I was writing the, um, I was finishing writing in the shadows of the state. And um, uh, so I, I had this whole like end bit in, in, in the shadows of the state, which was resurrecting um, Adivasi indigenous morality and ethics and saying, let's, what can we learn from them for a kind of new, new possibilities, very much in the spirit of, of fragments. And, you know, it was, David was doing like exactly the same thing that I was doing in, in, in the, at the end of In the Shadows of the State. And, um, and that's how we started talking to each other. And, um, but over the years, um, I've been so torn by this, right? Because I do want to um, resurrect the kind of moral and ethical possibilities that um, indigenous societies in India offer us to think about the world differently. But at the same time, those same societies are completely stratified and um, you know um, uh, the the new state of Jharkhand that was formed, the the chief minister. 
Minister uh, is now an Adivasi or was an Adivasi and was, you know, then em embroiled in a massive scam of um, offshore finance, uh, basically t got his hands dirty with multinational corporations and had, you know, um, uh, massive corruption scam. Um, and, you know, and now, of course, the same, so it's the same people that I worked with are now torn between, you know, on one hand, they were joining the Naxalites, but now they're all turning to the BJP and massive supporters of the BJP, right? Um, so I wanted to hear from both of you, I guess, uh, around on the place of, well, Kier puts it, social stratification, right? Um, within those uh, communities where we find alternative possibilities, which is like key to fragments, you know, how, you know, I mean, David kind of always evades this I question, I feel, uh, in all of his writings and in all of the conversations I had with him. But where do you find answers to David in, in this, in the fact that all the communities that we're working with, that were all those alternative communisms, you know, that we're finding are, are themselves totally stratified. Um, I'm sure you've thought about this a lot, especially Keir. I'm, I'm really, you know, given your own work, I'm interested in, in hearing where you see we take David forward uh, around this, this, which to me is a really crucial issue, issue for any kind of alternative possibilities that we as anthropologists, uh, we as, you know, we can offer. Um, okay, so that's, that's, um, yeah. Oh. Perhaps we may. Should we have had three already? Maybe we can we can have a response on that, and then I'll I'll pick up any other things in chat. Okay, or you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, shall I? Uh, I should, do you want to go first, or shall I go first? I'm easy either way. Uh, I don't have uh, a long response, but uh, Alpa's last question really stimulated me. Um, I think this lack of a Garden of Eden is valid for our present too. Um, there are utopic possibilities, egalitarian possibilities in these alternative spaces, alternative ethics that we explore. But I think uh, none of them are pure uh, none of them are unproblematic and to act otherwise would be some type of betrayal to, you know, and, and in terms of the fragments, I was, maybe this is the fourth time I'm reading that text, and I think we haven't really explored the part where uh, David actually theorizes revolutionary counterpower and dual power situations, and where he says, you know, it's a very difficult section of the fragments, actually, where he talks about how the possibility of violence uh, is ever present, even in situations of um, revolutionary counter power in practice. Of course, Alpa, you'll be very familiar with this. My own um, approach to all these contradictions is to, is to attempt to stare them in the face, but in my own ethnographic work, it was very difficult to come to terms with all the inequalities and hierarchies that I saw emerge, even in explicitly non-hierarchical spaces. So I think there's a tension that we constantly need to um, hold in front of our minds and write about them and think about them and as honestly as possible. I don't have a grand theory of why that is the case, if hierarchy is inevitable or not. Um, but I do want to have faith that it's not inevitable. Um, and that's a choice. That's a choice. Um, wow. OK. Uh, yeah, well, there's a number, a number of things have come up, and I'm probably going to not answer very well because there's now too many things in my head and I will probably forget certain things that I should mention. Um, but the first thing, I mean, how, oh, the, 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 the put, let, let's do last things first, yes, in a, you know, in a very David-esque manner, yes. And let's, uh, if we address what Alpa was saying, I think the idea that, um, for example, the whole point of Frankenstein anarchist anthropology in many regards is that one shouldn't be thinking about 
the so-and-so people of another part of the world as some kind of ideal anarchic egalitarian alternative to us whatever we might be and what i would suggest is when i work amongst i worked in east new britain papua new guinea and the people i work with were not exclusively but almost exclusively people of a group known as the tolai who were well documented in the ethnographic record um, going back to the work of Bill Epstein from the Manchester School in the late 50s and Richard Salisbury uh, in the 60s. And my feeling is this, is that although societies in Papua New Guinea were largely characterised as egalitarian by anthropologists of the colonial era, which was a very double-edged sword. On the one hand, it was a way of maybe, you know, it was that there was a degree of noble savaging going on. And as people have many people have observed, the term egalitarian was never really very well defined. What did you mean by egalitarian when you refer to these societies as egalitarian? And, and indeed, to bring it back to the issue of gender, as a number of feminist scholars, such as Lisette Josephades and other people pointed out in the 80s, egalitarian tended to mean egalitarian amongst men. And this, in many regards, is the background for all the interesting discussions that emerge around the publication of Gender of the Gift in the late 80s. So, I mean, the point here being is that a, even in a kind of allegedly pure manner, I don't think it's necessarily helpful to go looking for, as we might put it, pure egalitarianism. And then when I look at a place like East New Britain, the Gazelle Peninsula, where people, toe-like people have been conducting cash cropping on their own customary land for over 120 years, where massive social inequalities and economic inequalities have grown up over decades, to do with their entanglement in global markets, it doesn't make any sense anymore to start looking for some kind of pure form of egalitarianism there. These are, I would argue, class divided societies just as much as Britain or Norway are. So the starting point is not to be endlessly looking for the pure and perfect other of what we imagine ourselves to be, but to look at the particular dynamics of how hierarchies come into being and also how hierarchies are resisted or walked away from in those contexts. And I think that to my mind, I mean, once you accept the idea that, you know, as the old world systems theorists would have put it back in the 70s, that, the, you know, this, you know, people like Wallerstein or Eric Wolf, that this is a globally interconnected totality, it shouldn't be surprising that we find, you know, connections that cause different kinds of inequality to be emerging, but to be resisted in different ways in different places. So I'm not surprised to hear the kinds of stories that Alpa describes because they're very familiar to me from, from Papua New Guinea in many regards. When it comes, I, I'm sorry, I can't, the, the internet here cut out around, um, uh, uh, around the point that, 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 that Lim Zhao, that you got to the question part of what you were saying. So I, I'm afraid to say I completely missed the question. Um, so just, Apologies for not addressing that. Um, one thing I would like to say, though, is that the first contribution, the first question about it being fun. Absolutely. If anthropology and academia and indeed if revolution is not fun, if it is not playful, there is no point to it. And I'm reminded of the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the situationist writer, Raoul Vanigan, who wrote this, you know, this famous quote, I think it was taken up in the streets in 68, you know, that those people who speak of revolution without speaking of the contradictions of everyday life, those people speak with a corpse in their mouth. And I think it's also true that those people who speak about revolution, which is supposed to be about giving us back a spirit of human freedom from oppressive hierarchy and from the demands of the market or whatever it might be, if you speak about those things in a term with absolutely no enjoyment, no vitality, it, there's nothing revolutionary to it. And I think the great gift that David gave was to consistently speak about these things with an element of playfulness, to remind us that this is not just simply a dry and arid intellectual engagement, but it is about giving ourselves a world where we can have a bit more fun. And that's important as well. Absolutely. Um, Thanks, Keir. Um, I've got Steph Stefan Feuchtwang. Uh, Stefan, do you want to uh, unmute yourself, Stefan? Great. And now just the mic as well, please. I've unmuted and I can be seen. Perfect. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to particularly ask Asia. Asia um what you did you ever ask 
David about the law. Um, because what seems to me to be entirely missing in the dawn of everything, um, when, when he and Wengro, the other David, uh, set out the three elements of a state, uh, that's charisma by some kind of contestation, um, a, a, and, and a, um, violence, which is sovereignty, um, and uh, I've forgotten what the third one is now, but they don't include, uh, oh yes, knowledge, uh, secret knowledge through bureaucracy. Um, especially that last one does not include law. Yes, and it does. It, it does, David? Well, you, it's never stated to be law. Well, what do you think knowledge is? Well, for Christ's sake, everything is knowledge. Everything is the subject of knowledge and 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 as and and an object of knowledge. That's that's a, that's that's just a cop out. No, it isn't. It is because no, not, not everything is knowledge as a form of domination, which is what you're talking about. No, I'm not. I'm asking about the question of the organization that's required when you think about. The, the, uh, uh, an, uh, an association that covers global affairs, for instance, that is a question of law and sanctions on law, uh, of uh, sanctions against lawbreakers. I'm happy for Aisha to answer, but you're talking about three forms of domination, not knowledge per se. David. <laughs> I well, want Aisha to answer. Yeah. Well, I can't answer on behalf of the Davids, but I can say something about, I mean, I teach a course called Law and Violence. The main idea being that law is a form of violence. Um, so, yeah, I, but you're not interested in what I think, and I don't know what David I'm interested but, in what you think. That's why I asked you the question. Okay. So, um, you know, there's a section in the fragments where David Graeber says anarchists never tire of reminding of the man with the stick who shows up in spaces otherwise thought to be free, otherwise thought to be um, uh, spaces of um, freedom. But when there is a rule that is broken, the man with the stick comes. And, you know, that's the law. I, I, in my own thinking, uh, wouldn't allow me to posit law as ultimately compatible with a non-violent arrangement of social relations. Thanks, Aisha. Um, to end with, I'm going to invite um, uh, a question on ethnography, which I think is actually addressed in fragments, and maybe Keir might be able to um, uh, look at this question uh, and, and elaborate on it. My question, this is from um, Sandeep. Uh, Sandipan, uh, my question is what implication anarchist anthropology has on how we do ethnography to understand existing moralities? How do we capture the existing without losing it while, while, tra with, while, with, while translating, I guess, is, is what, what, um, what, what Sandipan meant. Um, uh, maybe if we have a kind of last reflection on the relationship between ethnography um, and the anarchist anthropology. And, and I know there's a section in fragments which addresses this. Keir, my hand, hand the floor to you as our final question. Oh, oh dear, because uh, you've asked me a question that although I feel the pressure as a reasonably senior academic to have a kind of ready answer for every difficult question, I will just fess up straight away and say that I'm not entirely sure what the answer to that is and if uh, I don't remember that section from the book just having read it two days ago again um, because my memory of Francis anthropology is very much the uh, when he's talking about ethnography at least a lot of it is a reflection upon to what extent 
we as anarchists, if we are anarchists, can use ethnography in different ways from the kinds of romantic appropriations we're used to using. Maybe I've completely blotted this from my mind, but I don't remember much discussion in the book about how anarchism might inform the practice of ethnography. Um, so how might, to speculate wildly, how might anarchism influence the practice of ethnography? And I don't think I have any particularly smart or clever answers to give there. And again, I betray the insecurity I feel now that I've been put on the spot and asked to be smart and clever and I am floundering. But how might this kind of anarchism impact how we do ethnography? I think the vision of anarchism that David lays out is one that suggests that, as we mentioned earlier, we should be looking rather than for grand overall theories of different kinds of social structures or different kinds of ontologies or different kinds of cultural systems. We should be, as David or Raoul Venegan were aware, alert to the contradictions of everyday life. And it is in those small battles over value that, as David puts it in another piece, out of which universes are born that we pay and take seriously, not trying to solve philosophical questions of our own academic reflection, but the living moral contradictions of everyday life by which people seek to withdraw from oppressive obligations and seek to build a life more worth living. I think that's the most important thing. And that therefore as a consequence, and maybe this brings us back to Alpha's story, that in any context, we begin with a degree of justified skepticism of the official story of the particular group that is told to us by the gatekeepers. And this is, I think, brings us back to the earlier conversation about good collegiality, which is that we all agree that good collegiality is a good thing, but we're also aware that in the mouths of certain individuals, good collegiality is something that is a weapon that is used to promote its opposite in the mouths of certain individuals. And when we do field work with any group of people, we should be on the, I think David would say that anarchism would imply we should always be on the, on, the, on the lookout for really nice sounding phrases that are being used by certain people to do their opposite. Whether it's collegiality, whether it's democracy, whether on some occasions it's decolonizing, whatever it might be, we should always be thinking who benefits from the use of this particular term at this particular moment and conducting our ethnography accordingly. Thank you, Keir. Aisha, if you'd like to have a last word, um, I give oh, us the no, last. Just, Thank you, Alpa. I, you know, uh, this section in the fragments where David talks about ethnography as possibility, I find it really hopeful, actually almost too hopeful about the possibilities of ethnography. It immediately makes me think of ethnographic resistance. Um, and it, the it's ever present possibility of emerging. I also want to merge my comment with somebody. There's an amazing discussion happening in the chat, by the way, that I've been distracted by following um, uh, about epistemic diversity. And do we not need some anarchism when it comes to epistemology and uh, the, the kinds of authority that anthropologists mobilize, especially in while they're doing ethnography. Um, I think to be able to reflect seriously on how anarchism could contribute to ethnography and vice versa, we need to reflect on a very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable matter which is ethnographic resistance. And I think if we do that um, seriously, we may find out what possibilities there really are. To be honest, I find uh, David Graeber a bit too hopeful um, in that regard. I think there's a really nice section in Fragments which talks about ethnography as a form of direct democratic process. And mm -hmm. in the same way that he, he resurrects our whole kind of colonial heritage or, um, of, of you know, all these archives of different societies that we have, he also resurrects ethnography uh, as, um, as a tool for the future, as a form of direct democratic process. Alpa, yes, that's the beautiful part, that's the hopeful part, but how many of us are able to imagine 
ethnography as that consensus building democratic process. That's all I'm saying. If we can do that, yes, ethnography can be a liberatory uh, tool as the way David imagined. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for participating in this session. Thank you for this incredible like chat comments as well, which, um, you know, lots of conversations going on. And uh, uh, it's lovely to see. I haven't been able to keep up with everything because you can't as chair, but um, lots of things that are catching my eye too. Um, uh, we see you all next week. Um, and uh, until then, have a great week. And thank you so much to Keir and to Aisha uh, for discussing discussing fragments with us and bringing us together. Thank you. So today there's no informal session because our speakers have to um, go off to other things.